Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Patriots History. Uh, I'm Larry Swikart. Co I'm your host and co-author of Patriots History of the United States, now in its 40th printing. It just boggles the mind. It just They just keep rolling these things out. Um, and, and yes, I'm working on an updated edition. Uh, Mike just sent me a bunch of um, comments, revisions, corrections that I need to get through in the next month or so. Uh, I'm probably not going to get this. I wanted it out this summer, but I'm probably not going to be able to get it out before next spring because I have another book that I have to get in before November. And uh, so there are just things that are stepping in the way, but we will get it out. It's mostly written. I mean, it's all written. It's just I have to um, include a couple more sources uh, that I found. And um, so there's that. Uh, I will remind you that we're adding stuff daily. If you're not paying attention, we're adding stuff daily to the VIP over at Wild World of History and to the Wild World of Politics over at the Wild World of Politics. So if you're a VIP member or an insider for politics, you're going to be getting um, new episodes. I recorded a new one just the other day on Churchill, Integrity, uh, new episodes on Globalism, its rise and decline, which is kind of a sneak preview of my next book. Um, uh, I've added a new little segment on Reagan that I learned recently, brand new stuff that even I hadn't found in my research. So <clears throat> you'll, you'll want to be a VIP member if you're not. There is so much stuff. On each side, there are at least four or five ongoing video series um, on different topics from Reagan to um, enduring lessons on life and citizenship, perfect for kids, to uh, the 1619 Project and the 1620 Default, which is why we should always default to the 1620 Pilgrims, um, globalism, all sorts of things, plus all sorts of great offers um, and ebooks that you're not going to find uh, in many other places, certainly not on Amazon or whatnot. A uh, reminder, my autobiography is just out of the rhythm of history. You can find that one on Amazon. That one is available now. And uh, let's see, anything else? I think that does it. <clears throat> so as always, I am reading from the 15th anniversary edition. So you want to take a look behind me, the one with the gold banner up top. And um, <clears throat> if you have an earlier edition, then it's probably okay. Uh, the page numbers aren't going to work out, but the headers should. We only changed a couple of headers since we've been doing the book. So if you can't find the page number I'm on, just look for the header. And we are currently in Chapter 5 which is a Small Republic, Big Shoulders, really one of my favorite chapters about how the, the nation really got started as a functioning country. It's one thing to get all rah-rah about the American Revolution. The American Revolution is great, but I am just intrigued with how these guys had so much foresight to set things up the way they did. Almost everything they did was perfect. They messed up a couple little things like the uh, the business about the president, the vice president could come from opposite parties, which they fixed. But by and large, they got it pretty much right. All right, so we are on page 149, and it's the very last header on the page called Beyond the Oceans and Mountains. Although America was an independent nation under the terms of the Treaty of Paris of 1783, that independence was fraught with ironies and contradictions. In the family of nations, America was a kitten among tigers. European powers with strong armies and navies still ruled the oceans and much of North and South America, despite American independence. In addition, Fading but still dangerous, forces such as those of the Ottoman Empire and the Barbary states were constantly a concern on the high seas. But an alliance with France threatened to embroil the young nation in a continental war almost immediately with the French Revolution of 1789. What course would American foreign policy follow? Would Americans form alliances with their democratic brethren in France 
or honor their English roots? Would they be able to trade with both nations? Was neutrality an option? These were the questions the Secretary of State faced, yet his proposed solutions ran counter to those of his arch enemy Hamilton and the Federalist allies. Unlike under this cloud, the members of the administration attempted to shape a foreign policy. Their first foreign policy initiative was to recreate the military establishment Congress had disbanded following the Revolutionary War. This was only natural given Washington's low opinion of the militia, quote, they come in, you cannot tell how, they go out, you cannot see when, act, you cannot tell where, and leave you at last in a critical moment, he wrote. So he didn't care much for the militia. No militia, Washington insisted, will ever acquire the habits necessary to resist a regular force. So again, I, I know I harp on this, but for a movie that got almost nothing wrong, stylistically, I mean, maybe a few historical points, like burning the church with the people in it, that never happened. But The Patriot was so good on so many levels. But every time I come to that one scene, it just irks me where um, Benjamin Braddock says to his son, Gabriel, who's watching the battle uh, through a window where the militia, the Continentals fire a round or two and then run. Um, Benjamin, played by Mel Gibson, comes up and says, that damn Gates, that, that Gates is a damn fool. Going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the English in open field is madness. Well, sorry, Mel. But in fact, that was exactly what Washington knew he had to be able to do to win the war. And he spent much of his time at Valley Forge training his Continentals, not the militia, but the Continentals in how to do exactly that, how to stand up to the English in open field and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. And eventually we were able to do so. Although it always helped if you could get behind some fences and some rocks and some cover, right? But nevertheless, he was able to do so. So um, he, he didn't have a high opinion of the militia. Federalist proponents of the con Constitution had called for a viable army and navy to back up national foreign policy decrees. The ratification of the Constitution brought this, quote, power of the sword once again to American government. Led by the Secretary of War, Henry Knox, Washington's artillery chief during the Revolution, who, by the way, if you missed my segment on this, was a, a bookseller. I mean, these guys led pretty much ordinary lives. Henry Knox is a bookseller. The Federalists reconstituted the Continental Army, renaming it the United States Army. Uh, Knox recruited 5,000 troops and commissioned an officer corps comprised mainly of Revolutionary War veterans and Federalist stalwarts. Now, if you remember, uh, I read from Washington his recommendation to Congress on creating a national military. And he said, I think we need one. It needs to be really small. Most important, though, he said, we need an officer class so that if and when we need to ramp up quickly, the officers will be able to correctly instruct everybody else. So they were big on training officers. Then Congress turned its attention to the Navy, which since the revolution had been a small collection of privateers. Congress appropriated monies for construction and manning of six frigates capable of long range operations. Now there is a book, um, by Ian Toll, T-O-L-L, -L, called Six Frigates. And we're going to get into a lot of this book later, which I've added as a new source in the new updated edition. It's absolutely fantastic. He, uh, It's about a 600-page book. He goes into the history of the funding of these six frigates, how they ended up fighting individual battles, um, with both the French and the British, how uh, they fought in the War of 1812. So it's just a fantastic read. I mean, uh, the guy is truly one of our better historians. He wrote a three-volume history of the war in the Pacific. 
World War II, outstanding, just phenomenal. So if you want to add to your library, go get Six Frigates by Ian Toll. At any rate, um, he goes into these debates, and Congress did finally uh, put up the money for six frigates. Now, a frigate of the day was the equivalent of a World War II era battleship. I know missiles and electronics and even nuclear weapons make some of this stuff meaningless. But at the time, guns were all that mattered, and heavy cannon at sea were all that mattered. I mean, obviously, maneuverability and the ability of a ship to sustain damage. Um, so the fact that Congress authorized six battleships, and I think Britain at the time had something like 100, maybe more frigates or large-scale battleships, things they would call battleships. <clears throat> but remember, they had an empire around the globe they had to protect. And so they couldn't send 100 ships to America. They might be lucky if they sent 20. Uh, and, and a flotilla of smaller vessels, right? What I'm saying is that this is not insignificant, that they built these six frigates. Following revolutionary precedent, small companies of U.S. Marines accompanied each Navy command unit. These Marines were um, soldiers who would fight at sea. Um, and at the time, they were not a separate branch of the military. Congress did not create a separate department of the Navy until 1798, when Federalists would realize their aim of a 10,000-man combined military force. As is often the case, events did not wait on policymakers to prepare. The Ohio Valley frontier had erupted into warfare after a flood of immigrants crossed the Appalachians, infringing on Indian lands. Miami, Shawnee, Delaware, and other tribes witnessed hordes of American pioneers streaming into their ancestral domain. Indian warfare escalated into attacks on rivermen. One boatman reported that, quote, the Indians were very troublesome on the river, having fired upon several boats and killing and wounding boat crews. The U.S. government had to respond. General Arthur St. Clair, Federalist governor of the Northwest Territory, led an army into the fray but met initial defeat. Newly recommissioned U.S. Army General Mad Anthony Wayne fared better, marching a large column into Indian Territory in 1794 to win an important battle at the victory at the Battle of Fallen Timbers. You got to, I'm sure if you're a soldier and somebody puts Mad Anthony Wayne in charge, you're kind of wondering why is he called Mad? Is he nuts? Is he angry all the time? And why is it why is he called Mad? but he was effective. A raid against a broad alliance of Indian tribes, Shawnee, Ottawa, Chippewa, Potawatomi, <clears throat> as well as Canadians, British, some French, and even a handful of renegade Americans, Wayne's larger force pushed the 2,000 Indians through the forest and pinned them against a British fort, which refused to open its gates. Mad Anthony preferred to let the Indians escape and deal with the chiefs, who, having their influence shattered, signed the Treaty of Greenville, 1795. <clears throat> Although these events temporarily marked the defeat of the Upper Ohio Valley tribes in what was termed the, quote, dark and bloody ground, violence plagued the Lower Ohio and Mississippi Valleys for another 15 years. This warfare revived concerns that Britons and Spaniards aided and encouraged Indian uprisings. I mean, this is always a thing. Are the British and are the Spanish funding these Indians? Are they uh, giving them weapons and trying to encourage them to attack Americans? <clears throat> um, these accusations highlight another Western foreign policy problem, hostile British and Spanish presence in, respectively, the Old Northwest and Southwest. <clears throat> Spain laid claim south of the Natchez, and west of the Mississippi by virtue of a French grant and the 1763 Treaty of Paris. Americans desperately wanted to sail goods down the river to New Orleans, but the Spaniards rightly saw this trade as a potential foot in the door, and they resisted it. Both sides found a temporary solution in Pinckney's Treaty, also called the Treaty of San Lorenzo of 1795. 
This granted American traders a three-year privilege of deposit, the ability to unload, store, and transship produce in Spanish New Orleans. So right of deposit is you can bring your stuff here. You can leave it here with an agent who will make sure it doesn't get destroyed. He has a bond for it, and then he will sell it to somebody else. As a farmer, just to clarify, you didn't accompany your, your goods all the way down to New Orleans, let's say from Ohio, and just sit there and wait till somebody showed up to buy them. You sold them to an intermediary, sometimes called a stock jobber, uh, more generously called a factor, F-A-C-T-O-R, who would then go about the job of selling um, for a commission. And usually his commission was a percentage, meaning the more he sold it for, the better he did. Um, and he would pay the farmer when the farmer deposited his goods there in New Orleans, and uh, then he would keep the difference, okay? And then the farmer, if he liked the guy, would come back and deal with him the next time. So it's a lucrative trade. It's very important that we got the right of deposit on the Mississippi. English presence in the Ohio Valley presented even more severe problem. In addition to being a violation of 1783 Treaty of Paris, British ties to Indian tribes made every act by hostiles on the frontier seem suspiciously connected to British interests. Washington's solution to these challenges, however, requires us to take a detour through the events in France. So our next heading, we'll get a little bit through this one on page 151, <clears throat> is the French Revolution and neutrality. The French Revolution of 1789 precipitated a huge crisis in American foreign policy. It was a paradoxical development, for on the surface, Americans should have been pleased that their own revolution had spawned a similar Republican movement across the Atlantic, just as the European intellectuals pointed with pride to America's war for independence as validation of Enlightenment concepts. Many Americans, most notably Jefferson and his anti-federalist supporters, as well as the rabble-rouser Tom Paine, enthusiastically supported France's ouster of the corrupt regime of Louis XVI. You'll remember, just to take a, a slight detour here, um, for a little history on what was happening in France. France was an overwhelmingly rural, agricultural, and uneducated nation. A, a map in, I think it was 1790, showed that there were only a handful of provinces in the entire nation where even 5% of the adult men could sign their name. Uh, France was racked with transportation and distribution problems. It, it didn't have rivers that were conducive to a whole lot of transportation of agricultural goods from the hinterland to the cities. Uh, you think of, for example, the Hudson brings all the farm goods right down to New York City. Um, you think of the Ohio brings farm goods right down to Cincinnati. And you think of the Mississippi brings farm goods right down all the way, hundreds and hundreds of miles, right down to New Orleans. France doesn't have that. No nation has that. I should point out to you, the United States has more navigable rivers than any nation in the world and more than the next two or three combined. Uh, by navigable, I mean you're able to sail from one end to the other. Um, the Nile is nearly as long as the Mississippi, but is useless in places because of the cataracts. Uh, the Amazon is pretty long, but you can't use it because... Um, it's jungle on both sides, and there is really almost no way to build settlements there or, or trade. So some of these areas, the Yangtze, the Yellow, the Indus, these are all rivers. The, the rivers in Russia, they run to nowhere. Uh, they, they either go nowhere or they are absolutely impossible to navigate or they um, are impossible to create a thriving civilization on the banks, but not America. Our river, rivers, and I think the number is that we have around 3,000 
total miles of navigable rivers and in interland coastal waters that are protected by islands, which are really like big rivers. Uh, you think of South Carolina, for example, or Catalina Island in California, or um, some of the islands down off Florida. In other words, there's no other nation even remotely close to our river system. Well, France had big problems because the, their, their rivers, like the Seine, um, didn't connect what they needed to connect, the, the heartland, hinterland with the big cities. Their road systems were horrible. Uh, if it rained, they just turned to mud and transporting wheat and grain across parts of France was <clears throat> extremely difficult, even under the best of circumstances. Now, what happened in 1788-89 was that they had a, a famine, and um, there were sufficient grain reserves in the exterior areas, but as I just mentioned, they couldn't get it to Paris. And and so there was a food shortage, a, a bread shortage in Paris, which caused prices to really, really rise. And you know the apocryphal story is that there was a march on the palace at Versailles outside of Paris, and, and the hungry people were marching out there, and they're clamoring at the gates, and the guards come up, what do you want? And the people go, bread's too expensive, we can't buy bread. He says, I'll pass it on. And he walks up and he he says to Marie Antoinette, she goes, well, what did they want? And he says, they said bread's too expensive. And she says, well, let them eat cake, which of course is far more expensive than bread. And, uh, you know, the story was this guy goes back and says, she said you can eat cake. And they go, what? And they say, you know, tear the system down. Historians don't think that happened. But nevertheless, it accurately captures the attitudes as it does today. You, you may be aware of a song as of this recording, this capture number one on Billboard, and it's Rich Men North of Richmond. And of course, all the elites are trying to darn this song, trying to damn it. You know, oh no, that's a horrible, terrible song. Oh, this guy's an idiot. But he sings from the heart. And he's singing about what many, many people in the interior of America are feeling with inflation. Well, the French were feeling serious inflation of their own. And, and so um, they uh, stormed the palace and they put King Louis and Marie under house arrest. Now, they had not executed them yet. And the French National Assembly was trying to decide what to do with them. <clears throat> and there were some that wanted to execute them right away. Um, but you have to understand that other nations in Europe saw this and reacted in horror. It's bad enough that those Americans kick out the king. But these people right on our back door. We, we've got to do something about this. So the other European nations, Austria, um, Italy, um, Prussia, formed a, an alliance to invade France and put the king back on the throne. Now, of course, you realize that many of these people are interrelated, that Louis had married a member of the Habsburg family in Marie Antoinette, so that all these families running Europe were interrelated. So they're trying to rescue their relatives, in essence. And they invade, and the French put out a really big army because they have a national draft, and France was a nation of 26 million people at that time, bigger than Austria and probably Prussia put together. And they, they defeat the invaders. Well, Sometime over this period, over the next two years, while this war is going on, <clears throat> Louis decides he's going to try to hightail it for the border and get across the border and, and get into Austrian hands where they can keep him safe and keep Marie safe, right? 
And this is called the Flight to Varenne, V-A-R-E-N-N-E-S. This is all part of my world history course. And uh, they climb in a coach at night. They hightail it out of Paris. Um, the guards weren't watching very closely. They got away <clears throat> and they head toward the border, but they made the mistake of stopping at a, I like to say stopped at a Circle K or 7-Eleven or something. And they sent the coachman in to pay for, you know, Diet Pepsis and Ho-Hos and Cheetos and those, that kind of thing for the road. And they pay in what? Gold coins. Well, whose picture is on a French gold coin? The king. And, and the guy's taking the money and he's looking at that carriage out there and the king's there. Does that and he sounds the alarm and riders go out and before too long, the coach was overtaken. And at that point, the National Assembly said, this guy's a traitor and we got to get rid of him. So they sent Louis and Marie Antoinette to the guillotine. Um, so that's what's happening in France that is causing consternation over here. Yeah, we like the revolution, but you guys have taken it too far. So French Republican leaders echo Jefferson's words in the Declaration when they call for liberté, égalité, fraternité, and issued their own Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen. Unfortunately, France's revolutionary dreams went largely unfulfilled in part because of important differences in the presumption of power and France's absence of common law. That is, the French were still used to doing things top down. So that's how their assembly basically did things. And the so-called third estate, which was in charge of everything, which is a bunch of lawyers, um, was a bunch of merchants, bankers. Uh, it was not common people. And so they began to adopt a bunch of laws that were not particularly helpful to common people. The tyranny of King Louis was soon replaced by the equally oppressive dictatorship of the mob and Robespierre. Blood ran in the streets of Paris and heads literally rolled beginning with Louis' own in 1793, as I just told you. <clears throat> A new wave of violence and warfare across Europe, pitting France against every monarchy on the continent, exactly as John Adams had predicted in a letter to his wife. All right, that's a good place for us to start next time, to leave off this time and pick up next time. Remember, folks, we are trying to turn Patriots history into a feature film. I can't tell you how good this is going to be. We, we've got the idea for the pilot. We're already writing the screenplay. That's that's milestone one. Milestone two is that we get a line budget to find out exactly how much a screenplay is. Milestone three is we raise that amount of money. But all the money that's coming in from buy me a coffee right now is going right into a savings account with that business on it. So we're putting all that money that comes in to buy me a coffee toward the film. So help us out. Go watch the trailer at Wild World of History and you're going to love it. Buy me a coffee after you do. And I'll see you guys back here on Friday.